So the only response I will offer is, read my column in the mail. <laughs> Everyone within that ANC leadership is, is very alive to that, uh, you know, the president is going to emerge and, and get a second term. So you have a presidency that is built essentially on thievery. So your president's involved in like money laundering. So there was like a kidnapping. There was a couch. They all cling to it was his money. Morality in politics is questionable. What I believe is necessary is a common goal. And a politics of hope, not anger. Protocol observed because our discussion tonight is mostly around politics. So, this is not an ordinary critical thinking forum. I'd like us to all begin taking the journey as South Africans and as active South Africans to begin thinking and having discussions around solutions to the many problems that we have in South Africa. And at this particular one is the beginning of numerous ones that we're going to be taking into 2023 around coming together and understanding what is happening in our country, getting the information, listening to the experts, and then all coming up together with solutions. And I'd like us, by the time we leave here, there are questions that have been sent um, virtually uh, by uh, the people who would have loved to have been here tonight. But I'd like everyone and anybody at home who will be watching this um, to leave here having gotten some sense of usefulness and useful information from this discussion and then seeing how we all in our different sectors can start rebuilding the South Africa. So to begin today's topic, we are going to be focusing on what is going to happen in 2023, in 2024 how as active citizens we can better be better prepared for the politics our governance issue going into those two years but before we get there we need to better understand how our country got here how our country came to a standstill because of the politics uh, that we are seeing how our country has come to a standstill because of Palapal, and how, as citizens, do we begin to engage with that particular process? However, I'm not the one who has all the answers. Our panel tonight. I will be handing it over to our brilliantly capable panel. And before I take my seat, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Dr. Susan Mbofu Walsh, the author, lecturer, and Udata Kahakim, aka Utembegile. He will be in discussion with activist, political analyst, and director at the Rivonia Circle, Tessa Dooms. Mail and Guardian senior political journalist, Lizek Gatandwa, and University of Johannesburg's political professor and author, Professor Mkabisin Lejan. Welcome to our panel. And now I'm going to hand over to you, Dr. Mbofu Walsh. Thank you so much, Magaziana, for the kind introduction. Thank you all so much for being here. And let's dive right into it because, goodness me, there's no shortage of content for this evening's discussion. Let me start to my immediate right. And I think the first theme that I'd like to cover as we start to broaden more and more as the discussion goes on is where we are right now. How do you analyze the situation confronting the president and how do you think we should think about this pala pala do we call it a crisis do we call it a situation do we call it a debacle um, and try to analyze that situation for us and we'll move from there so can i start with you uh Tessa? sure um i call it a speedy speedy because you know <laughs> we've been given a lexicon by the anc we should use until the end um 
when I think about the para para issue, for me, I don't want to fixate too much on the details. And there's a re the only reason I say that is not because I don't think the details are important, but I don't think we know the full universe of the details. What I do want to focus on is what this tells us about the moment in politics we're in and the kind of politics we have and the kind of politicians we have. The first thing that struck me about the entire Palapala Pala thing is that from the moment those, those allegations have been made, we've had a president who has not seen it fit to talk to the nation about it. I was in Germany maybe a week after Palapala Pala broke, and I was meeting with people in government. And I was hearing people go, so your president's involved in like money laundering. So there was like a kidnapping. There was a couch. I mean, it was extraordinary, the kinds of things that were being said, and the accusations were not small, and they're not small. Um, people are minimizing it by saying it's his money, whatever that means. Because we've been desensitized as a country to the lowest possible bar for where we know something is wrong. So because it's not taxpayers' money, we shouldn't care because corruption in the state is the only thing that's now the worst possible sin. Which makes me then ask, when did we get to a point where we don't care about the ethics of our leaders? We only care about the legal um, consequence of what they do. And I think part of it is a consequence of what the ANC has done by saying that the step aside rule is about if you're charged. Or the ANC saying, you know, we, we'll, we'll deal with somebody disciplinary when they're found guilty in a court of law. They made the standard the law. And so ethics in leadership has just been wiped out of the entire thing. And you can have a president who has basically put us in the eyes <laughs> of the world. The world is like looking at us going, well, that's shady. Um, especially because we also rode on the idea of having the Madiba kind of iconic figure. And now we have a president who doesn't think he needs to even address the country on this thing. And we'll go to the ANC, will say that he'll subject himself to any process but being accountable to us. So that thing struck me really hard and I thought, we need a more accountable politics. But the, the last thing about where we are in this particular week, mm. let me just think about the idea of how entrenched big man politics is in our country and the consequence thereof. We literally are a country on tenter hooks, not asking is there validity to these claims, but saying, oh my goodness, if there, are if, if there is validity to the claims, who comes next? And we're making our decisions based on the fear of who comes next, rather than on whether there's something to answer for here. And I, I can't live in a country where our entire political future and fortunes are based on one person's ability to stay or go. That just means that we, are, we have a dearth of leadership it means for me the ANC has proven that it doesn't have a depth of leadership in itself that it trusts. But as a country, I mean, we are looking around at each other and we can't see in each other enough in terms of our common identity and our common skill sets and capacity that we could withstand one person resigning and it would be okay. And we can't even think about leadership that could take it over. That's a bigger crisis for me. Thanks so much for situating us and provoking us. Um, and Prof, how do you make sense of the last week in our politics? And how do you also respond to some of the things that, that Tessa has said? Well, it's an intensification of political warfare. Mm. <clears throat> We've been at this for quite some time now in the ANC with different factions, competing factions with different visions of how society should be ordered. Um, and this, I mean, it's, it's a, see, political power is al always open to being abused. Um, corruption has always been there, historically, throughout the world. Um, and perhaps in our own country, our own political elite is even more vulnerable to abuse of power for corrupt purposes, um, especially because of their financial precarious situation and 
So, I mean, Mandela in 1997 warned against uh, people in the ANC using power for uh, self enrichment, for careerism, and all sorts of things. And it was very clear at the time that the ANC would encounter a serious problem with patronage, seeking, and all that. Um, and you have, you have two contending factions where uh, perhaps for valid reasons, people want to maximize their access to power to build a nest, mainly because quite a number of them didn't have papers. These are politicians who've become career politicians dependent on public life for their own livelihood. And at the same time, you have the, all these noble ideas about what kind of society that you want to build. And perhaps some are more resist, resistant to corruption and uh, all the benefits that comes with it. And for me, that has been, perhaps to simplify it, you have this, this uh, reform-minded leadership as well as the patronage-oriented faction. Uh, there was a group, I mean, Tabo and a whole lot of them, about building institutions, building this, having the ANC as a revolutionary movement, uh, providing ethical leadership and all that. But you had some of them who were more concerned about day-to-day -day bread and butter <coughs> issues. And that uh, this fight surfaced somewhat in the early 2000s and culminated quite sharply in the JZ, NPA, arms deal kind of thing. Of course, there are a lot of details about the arms deal, who got what and for what purpose. Um, and, uh, and so this faction, this reform-minded faction, was more about tightening up institutions, the rule of law. And I think the Scorpions was partly intended at that. And of course, the patronage faction of the ANC, and most of them having been implicated in all sorts of things going back to the 90s, resisted that law-oriented kind of approach to issues. Uh, perhaps this is a simplification, but I'm sure we'll get to the details of it. And so you've always had that. And so the fight, the assault at the NPA, at the Scorpions beginning in 2005, was a defense attack, a preemptive attack to dilute these anti-corruption agencies to enable these folks who had become comfortable with access to state resources to continue doing this. And JZ's victory was in fact a triumph of the pat patronage-based faction of the ANC. And JZ obviously went on and oversaw a construction of a patron-client network. And the success of that patron-client network then rested on him diluting state institutions that were meant to fight corruption. And so this is what you had. People who were employed, they didn't deserve the jobs. They're forever grateful to Baba for being appointed into these posts. So they, they did the bidding of the politicians. And so Zondo, what Zondo has been doing now, obviously uh, exposed all that from 2008-9. And so, so you have a presidency that is built essentially on thievery. And of course, thieves like good life. They never contemplate prison. Prison is not, you think of sushi and all sorts of other things. So prison is quite the opposite of that. And so the idea of prison is quite dreadful. And so they would do everything, not only to protect their access to patronage, but also to prevent going to prison. So the civil presidency then comes as an antidote, as, as the opposite to that, the thing that might just land them in prison and end the spoils, access to the spoils of power. So from the very beginning, civil was always the enemy. He was the enemy for, because, and, and also because of how they couched uh, the success of the ANC, that the success of the ANC rested on reforming the cleaning up and undoing the JZ legacy. And undoing that meant 
demonstrating that you were actively fighting against corruption. And fighting against corruption meant a lot of ANC people were likely to go to prison. So they were always looking for this thing. Um, uh, and, and Cyril got clumsy, Arthur got lucky, uh, you know, landed on something. Um, and, and so this is political warfare. I mean, we can discuss uh, whether or not this is legitimate, pala pala, how the money got under Mastras' dresser and all sorts of, but, but you, you are seeing a culmination, a continuation perhaps of this political warfare that had started in the ANC as early as the 90s, yeah. Thanks, and we'll come back to the, details, the yeah. various details and themes, but I think we've already set up a fascinating picture for where we are as a country right now in this last week. And Lizeka, you've probably more than any South African been right at the heartbeat of what's been happening in our country for the last week. Can I ask you to reflect on what you've already heard, but also maybe take us behind the scenes of some of your reporting and how you've been able to see up close one of the most monumental weeks in South African politics? Well, uh, I tend to disagree with the prof somewhat. Uh, in some of his points. I do think that the Cyril administration, I mean, there was a huge euphoria around Cyril. And for some reason, South Africans, um, you know, somehow forgot or decided to um, be unaware of that Cyril was actually in that NEC that Prof is talking about, you know, spelling out the, the Zuma years, which he was the deputy president at that time. He was in that NEC for over 24 years, uh, during the time of Mandela up till the time of Jacob Zuma. Yes, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa presented uh, a, a unique environment in the ANC in that it was time for a cleanup. And I think that had it been Cyril or anyone else, um, they would have had to, you know, start reforms within the ANC because I think South Africans were well aware and had, were hurtful or had enough of what was going on within the ANC. The decline of the ANC in terms of, of the polls was a signal that the ANC needed to correct itself, to self-correct. And Cyril was that vehicle. Fair enough, Cyril you know, uh, was loved by both the white and the black South Africans. But what I tend to um, not a caution against is this idea that you know Cyril is surrounded by these vultures and he's this vulnerable person that uh, and there is, seems to be he's circled and he's this vulnerable person and he seems to be the only one fighting to undo the corruption or to uh, ensure that the ANC moves away from its image to rebrand the ANC. I think it's absolutely uh, nothing uh, but but a fuss. Um, Cyril, what has happened with Palapala is we've unearthed who the man is. He is just like any other ANC um, uh, political leader. And um, I think if you look at, for instance, the intricate details about Palapala, the fact that he owns a corporation and is the sole shareholder in that corporation. So which means that he knew very well that you know, he was treading a, a fine line. He was going into uh, a, a situation where he was acting unlawfully, and knowingly he was acting unlawfully. Even the fact that he was, has the audacity not to even um, you know, have some sort of response to the questions that the ordinary South Africans ha have, it does, is a telltale sign of a man who has been uh, entrenched in ANC, in the kind of ANC character. This is something that we've seen with um, Jacob Zuma. We had seen that. He was a man who was thought to be above the law, and seemingly that's what Cyril is, is, is becoming. Hmm. Um, really interesting and fascinating, and I want to go a bit deeper on everything we've said, because I think there's a tendency with panels like this where we move from one thing to the other, and we never actually respond or engage. So can I, can I open another round just for, for where we are and maybe for each of you to respond to different points that have been made? Well, I'm keen to respond to her. <laughs> OK. Can, 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 uh, can, can I come to Tessa? Can I go in the same order, Prof? Uh, sure, and sure, and sure. You, you might have even more things to respond to after Tessa goes. But, but also to say that I think the, the points you made 
um, are also representative of a, a large swathe of public opinion now. And I think there's a huge, quite divided debate in the country. And it's important that we have that debate. Um, and I think we couldn't have better people to have that with right now. So can I, can I ask for another round on this theme? And can, could I also ask within this round, of course, respond and engage, but to also consider the legal challenge at the Concord now and how that plays into um, the political climate um, as, as we see it. Sure. So uh, the idea of the ANC's factions, um, I, I, I don't think there's continuity in, in factions generally, but I certainly don't think there's been a continuity in factions um, over the last um, decade. Um, and maybe even more importantly, the idea that there's a good faction and a bad faction, I think is the wrong way to think about the ANC. It's a faction of different interests. Different people's interests are served in different ways by different factions. Um, and the one thing that I think has been missing in the ANC's factional battles, and I think it's become a feature of our politics in the main, even outside of the ANC, is that people aren't coalescing around ideas. So that there, or even agendas that, that are real ideas. I mean, the RET faction is such an interesting thing because the RET, we don't even say radical economic transformation anymore because that would be an idea. RET is not an idea. RET is a grouping. You know, we don't talk about radical economic transformation because if it really was coalescing around the idea then we would see more of a quote-unquote battle of ideas. If you asked me what the equivalent would be for the Soro Ramaphosa faction, even just the 2017 version, I don't know what that is. Renewal isn't an idea, it's a process. What is the big idea around which people are putting their political power into in the ANC? A transformative idea for the country. At best, renewal was about the ANC. But it's certainly, that faction, even in its form in 2017, was not speaking to South Africa at all. It was speaking about the ANC, it was not speaking about the country. And so we must come to terms with the fact that the ANC is not talking about us. They barely talk about us. So when we think about the implications for, for where we are now and, and this presidency, um, number one, like I said, there's an accountability issue that we have to deal with um, in some way or the other. Um, because we cannot have a party and president and all of that that just think that they don't have to account to the country. I am particularly excited about the legal challenge. It's the first thing I've been excited about in this entire palapala thing. Mm. Because going to court actually means the president has to actually put his name to something finally. He has to actually say, no, that detail's correct and this detail is incorrect. Somebody pointed out that in um, the statements that he gave to the panel, there weren't affidavits. So he still hasn't legally put his name to something. He's avoided answering questions in parliament, the protected space. We need this president to be willing to go on the record and say certain things. I've never heard of somebody who's been a victim of crime who says, no guys, the matter is sub judice. I can't talk about the crime that was committed against me. It makes no sense. If I was a victim of crime, I'm willing to talk about the ways in which I've been victimized unless I know things you don't. And I need to know that the country has systems that don't allow anybody to go into a position that important without accountability legal, ethical, moral, and political. The, uh, the, the other thing I'm, I'm really actually a bit confused by at this point is why we've let parliament get away with sluggish jobs over the years. This is a moment for parliament to really show its chops. Even ANC MPs, and I don't mean about whether they vote to impeach or not, but if they choose to vote not to go through an impeachment process, I have a big problem with that. I have a big problem with that because an impeachment process is not impeachment. It's a process to allow us as a nation to consider the facts. It's exactly why the Zonda Commission 
we, we don't have to agree with everything about the Zondo Commission. But the reason why it was such an important thing for our country is it gave us a moment to see information in plain sight and to weigh that information up as the public, not behind closed doors, not in, you know, steeped in legal jargon we couldn't understand. We got to see it for ourselves. And I think this president owes us that, but this parliament certainly owes us that. The quality of debate in this parliament has been poor, the quality of accountability has been poor, and this is the moment to step up, because if this president is innocent, an impeachment process is the best place to find out. You'll be surprised that I partly agree with Tessa, by the way. <laughs> um, I think I think you can't you can't draw a cold line between the two factions, uh, perhaps for the sake of conversation and simplicity, um, it's important, but also because there are people who are clearly identified with the reform-minded part of the ANC. I think Joel and Matabi Lejamin are two different people. Um, one of the things, for instance, if you take um, uh, Minister of Police, Tlele. Uh, One of the things, controversial things that Tlele did uh, when he came in, or soon after he had come in, was not to renew Robert McBride's contract as the director of IBAD. And Robert had done a splendid job going against corruption and this and that. And, and everybody was happy with Robert. Parliament was happy. But when it came to this small matter of renewing of contract, they decided not to, because Robert had been pursuing some of the corrupt elements. And, and I, I've always wondered why Tyler did that, and I've always called him out on it. Um, and so, so this, this explains the blurriness of the lines. Um, but, but overall, um, and, and, and this is the point that Lisa like had raised earlier, um, in politics, um, well, Cyril was there, obviously, and um, you know, I, someone was telling me that he spent most of his deputy presidency telling Jay Z how well he was doing. Yeah. He was the only Jay Z to support <laughs> him to succeed, uh, Jay Z, and Cyril thought that Jay Z would support him. Um, and Jay-Z had other ideas. He thought the X was more reliable than Cyril. So Cyril was basically, you know, sticking it out, making sure that he creates space for him to succeed this fellow, but it didn't work out. But that's politics. <sighs> in Urban Bagot, even in church, even in church and politics, Morality in politics is questionable. It's, it's, uh, we have to be a little bit more nuanced about it. Um, because politics, you have to play dirty, you have to, but if you want power. At times, it's not about what you do, perhaps it's about what you do with when you get into power, whether you are able to do the good that you intend to do. Nobody gets into politics being nice. It doesn't happen, it has never happened. Even in church, you don't get to be bishop by being nice. So, so I understand Cyril. I understand Cyril. That's what anybody else would have done in politics, back, backstabbing and all sorts of things. But the, the, perhaps he has not been as bold and courageous to live up to the promise that he had held up at the beginning of his term. And part of his failures, this thing, Lendo Palapala is largely a reflection <laughs> of his competence, incompetence to some degree. Incompetence. Mm. I think we were too uh, glowy initially about this presidency. It comes from business, this and that. He's smart and the intelligence community, that he never paid attention to. Um, from the appointment of, of Ayanda Jojo there, out and out enemy, uh, to head an institution that had become created into Jay Z's image. 
Because Cyril knew that coming into office, he was going to undo JZ's legacy. So the intelligence which JZ had created would instantly turn into an enemy. But it didn't do much to reconfigure the intelligence so that it supports his agenda. So Ayanda is there. He ignored Ayanda. When the Durban things happened, the unrest, the Security Council Committee, or whatever it's called, had never met since Cyril came into power. Never met. They only met on day after the unrest. Ayanda says um, she, they had sent, the intelligence does this uh, intelligence estimates that they do every month. They send to everybody. She sent to Cyril that and also followed up with a call and say, Mr. President, we have to meet. I'm hearing this chatter. The committee has to meet. Cyril never responded, acknowledged receiving, never responded. He just snubbed her. Uh, so the intelligence community was caught napping, completely dysfunctional, working to some degree against JZ. And you had Arthur with this parallel agency on the side doing his thing. So to some degree, India of Mela now, I agree with you. But, but I think there are certain people who stand for something. Things may be, may, be, may be gloomy, not as bright as we, people we thought may be heroes may not, may not be as heroic as we expect them to be. But I think there are people who stand for something. And part of the reason why in the NEC you still have people fighting for Zondo, fighting for the appointment of Batoi, fighting. We've got to differentiate here. The details of everyday news might not be good. But I think there are things that are happening that suggest that there are people who are fighting for something. So hence at some point one then is led to this conclusion that there is a faction that is reform-minded. It might not the lines might not be completely uh, clear, but, but there are people uh, who are fighting for something. They believe in the idea of a, a good South Africa, yeah? Um, <laughs> 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 uh, Prof makes valid points, and um, I, I was just thinking as he was speaking about Ayando Lolo and that lack of communication uh, between her and uh, principal, the president at that time, um, taking it, putting it, you know, putting it forward, and uh, taking it to today, for instance, uh, just to talk about Cyril and his uh, inward-looking um, and his incompetence um, and his naivety in terms of in terms of politics. Tabumbegi comes out very early on. Um, shortly after, I think it was independent, had broke the story around Arthur Frazier, uh, Jesse Dwight had just passed away. Uh, he comes out and says, um, calls Cyril, we have the story, please go to the Mail and Guardian and read it. <laughs> we weren't asked to write the story. <laughs> he calls Cyril, um, calls Gwede Mandashe, meets with David Mabuza and Paul Mashadile, separately, says to, to the four gentlemen, um, we need to be a, uh, get ahead of this. Uh, if not for the good of the country, for the good of the party. Tamon Begi, we all know, is a, is a mm. man who is very uh, grounded in the ANC. Mm. All four gentlemen, as far as we could surmise, agreed that the party needs to get ahead of this. Um, and there was uh, talk around how the four gentlemen would look at, you know, how the party is going to respond to this. Uh, fast forward four months later, the panel comes out, the ANC has no strategy. The ANC had four months to plan for what they could possibly do in terms of responding to this. They have got no strategy. And we're talking about a faction of Cyril Ramaphosa, who are yes men, um, a Ramaphosa faction, which has 
in itself has not really questioned or held the men accountable. If we're talking about leaders, uh, ethical leadership, if we're talking about leaders who have a vision for South Africa, which is the Ramaphosa faction, which is everybody seems to expect that the Ramaphosa faction has some realistic idea of where the country is going. But when you look at things in terms of Palapala and how they've all themselves have responded to it, they've taken uh, what he says at face value, when you speak to the Guedemantashes of the world, they will cling to it was his money. So therefore, there is no basis on calling him cor corrupt. Uh, it gives you an idea of where we are in terms of the That's ANC. Cool. <laughs> the buy is very low. Some help, okay. <laughs> the buy is very <laughs> low. So in essence for me, I, I, I'll borrow from, from Cyril himself, I was very shocked <laughs> I was very shocked by the reaction of South Africans um, around Palapala, uh, intellectuals, uh, the middle class, even um, the, the poorest South Africans, how South Africans reacted to this kind of tells you how um, it's, it's a matter of we've lost our sense of self. The, the architecture of the ANC has become our own architecture, and which is very sad uh, when you look at it, for, to a, a point where an ordinary South African will say that, will call in on a radio station and say the man must be left alone because it was his money. Mm -hmm. Not, not um, you know, withstanding everything else, the fact that he might have flouted the constitution. Um, I've lost my train of thought, but, um, I think at this point, there's a lot of work that we need to do as a country. Um, there's a lot of work that we need to do, not only as a country, but also institutions. Mm -hmm. I will add even the fourth estate, us as, as the media, um, in terms of how we structure our news, especially us as political journalists. Um, I mean, we, we always focus on these palace politics and factions, not really giving South Africans an idea of where the country is going, not really looking at you know, some what, should, what should be part of the conversation, because media is the agenda setting. But I think, uh, I, 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 <laughs> I really have lost my train of thought, but no, we're gonna, we, come, uh, yeah. we're gonna we, come back to, okay. to a lot of those wider questions, and I'm glad that you've set the stage for that, Lizaga, because I think as our conversation unfolds, it's important for us to, to go wider and deeper than the president and even the ANC. Um, so I think having said that, and can I stay with you, we've looked at the president, and again, do feel free to come in and, and respond uh, as you see fit, but we're gathered here on this panel supposedly to talk about the conference. Well, that's what we thought when we set this whole thing up. Right? And little did we know that the conference would seem in some ways insignificant compared mm. to all that's happened. Um, but it's a crucial, crucial moment in, in our democratic life. And it'll be fascinating to see how historians look back on this conference. But can, can you start to deepen our understanding of where we are in terms of this upcoming conference now, especially in light of what's happened? I think many people before this week saw this as something of potentially a coronation. Yes, some of the details mm -hmm. are interesting, but the president seemed to be marching towards uh, a decisive victory, at least by some estimates. Um, where are we now, and how does this conference figure in the future of South Africa next year? Uh, from, from my perspective. I, I think rather than hurting the president, I think what has happened in the past few days has actually hel helped him in terms of the ANC and, his bra and the branches within the ANC. Um, wow. the, the rally around the president, um, how you look at, for instance, the NEC, even within the NEC, even Tony Engeni, who is always vocal, wasn't able to come out right and say the president must resign or step aside within that NEC. Um, looking at it, 
the 20th of December, unless there is a change. Oscar Mabuyane just said on uh, today that he, uh, there is a plan amongst uh, the chairs, all nine provinces, to come together and meet and talk about an uncontested mm. um, uh, ANC election. Yeah. Um, so that tells you something. Oscar Mabuyane is obviously someone who's very close to the president. Uh, tells you where that is going. I think everyone within that ANC leadership is is very alive to that. Uh, you know, the president is going to emerge and and get a second term. Um, I'm, I would be very shocked or surprised if Zuelim Kiza makes uh, you know arises or emerges. Um, but the ANC. As it stands now, it's, it's going to be very difficult for them to campaign with a president who's under investigation from eight d uh, different state agencies. Um, I think that's overall what they are going to be focusing on after these elections is how or if they'll be able to uh, allow the man to be the chief campaigner uh, for the party. Um, I think if you're looking at it now, I think the Ramaphosa is still in the sweet spot. Nothing has hurt him. Yeah, I want to jump in on that. You know, the year is 2006, seven, somewhere around there. And the ANC is teaching us that it loves a martyr regardless of its baggage. And this is round two. Round two is the ANC will rally behind somebody who is considered to be an underdog. And the reason why it was happening at that point was that the very people, some of who are around Ramaphosa's table right now, like Gwede Mandash, were the ones around the Jacob Zuma table at that point, saying, ah, oh, we can turn this thing around for you. And why? Because they thought they could control him because he was in a weakened state. And they thought they could be friend. And that's how that patronage line got long. Because you take a compromised person into a position of power, they are there at your behest, and then they are in your debt. The Guptas were only a small part of the patronage line. The patronage line started well within the ANC's ranks itself, where people's political futures were hinged on somebody who they brought into power who would never have gotten there without them and was then indebted to them. We are sitting on this, the same issue right now. We're sitting on a, a, a set of circumstances where whether the president is guilty or not, we don't have a court of law, sure. But it's completely true. And I think that's the reason why, and I believe that he, he offered to resign. I completely believe that. No one's going to tell me that that story just made itself up. And I think he, he offered to resign because he himself would know that going into an election where you're going to have to face the public more often than ever with a new headline coming out from the different reports that are still going to land. This is one report that's landed. We have no idea what the content is going to be of the PP's report, of the SARS report. And all of those are going to land as headlines week after week. And he's going to have to answer these questions in perpetuity. And he's already shown us he doesn't want to answer questions. So he can see that this is going to be a problem for him. But if the fixers can fix, then they're in his good graces. And if they're in his good graces, they can then start running amok and doing whatever they want. And he has less power. It's the same thing with the Didi Mabuza question. Didi Mabuza was instrumental in getting President Sonoma Ramaphosa into the pound seat. And so whether or not he has allegations or whether or not people believe he's good or bad or whether he's disappeared over the last five years into whichever space he's been in, the president can't look at Didi Mabuza funny because he knows he owes him a debt. We are sitting in a very dangerous situation. The ANC situation is worse if Ramaphosa wins because he now carries this baggage but he will also have a whole new layer of people who will be in his debt. How will they deal with it? I think we have to accept that our politics 
is very adversarial. There may be serious disagreements over where we want to go as a country. Perhaps others have cases to answer and they are willing to bring down the regime so that they never get to answer those things. And what has happened in the course of that, going back to 2005-2006, is that innuendo, gossip, spy allegations have been part of our political discourse. And there are people who have tried quite hard for us to believe that a report that doesn't make sense, riddled with lots of spelling mistakes by someone who obviously cannot write, shitty report, that we take it as truth. And, and all these things are thrown at people for the purpose of discrediting them so that they feel ashamed, they get to resign. And so let's accept the fact of the comparativeness and the, the ugliness of it. Especially the ugliness, that they will be ugly. And so when ugly happens, what do you do? Do you succumb to ugly and say ugly is correct? By the way, it does look corrupt, so you must go. I think what we should say is that if we believe that we have fully functional law enforcement institutions in this country, let them investigate. Cyril will be accused today, Tessa will be accused tomorrow, someone else will be accused the next day. And the only constant that stands in sifting whether or not this is true, our institutions, that's where we need to focus our fight on. And so the impeachment thing, the, the, the pala pala thing, uh, I don't know, Hazim has just shown up now, apparently he's not a fictitious figure, but the president still has to explain why the money might not, was under. He says the manager was away and so Ndlovu thought it's safer under the matras than and all those things. So, so, but these are things that are being investigated by the Hawks, by uh, Reserve Bank and everybody else. So I, I would, I gladly surrender my fate to law enforcement institutions that simply believe in that because we've had instances of people being corrupt, therefore the president must be corrupt. Conviction by notoriety. I think we should let law enforcement investigate. This report is shady. It's shady, rather. This report has a lot of loophole. I've written my column. By the way, go and get me. <laughs> <laughs> I've pointed out the loopholes. He might as well survive this thing, Caesar. But what I'm hoping that he will not survive is, that, is a thorough investigation by the institutions that we've set up. So the only defense really, the only mechanism that we have to ensure that we remain a healthy democracy is that our institutions are fully functional. You can come up with any, you know, uh, uh, accusation, right? I mean, some of these accusations are people who want us to believe that one plus one is 11. When one plus one is two, there's a formula to finding the truth. So let's stick to the formula to finding the truth and not, and not be persuaded by nice sounding sound bites and rhetoric and indulging our own uh, disapproval of people. Law enforcement, the rule of law, that's where I stand. So I thought we were already having quite, quite the conversation, but now you've just taken us into <laughs> all new realms, Prof. Um, and I'm also mindful of Lizega's point that in some ways, we can become so absorbed in the presidential crisis that we, we stop thinking about the future, let me put it that way, or we become disabled from imagining ourselves out of this crisis. And so I'd like to open up a round of discussion. Of course, again, feel free to engage if, if, if you'd like to, but if you can tinge it now with a sense of where to from here. Because I think no matter where you stand on the, the Palapala report or the Nobo report or the Concord 
uh, decision and how it might decide, or even the conference. Everyone is dissatisfied with the status quo. I mean, no one thinks where we are is, is in a good place. So how, how do we extricate ourselves from this, from this crisis? Can I take the lead on that one? You can start because you haven't started any others, <laughs> and then we'll, come to, then we'll come to Tessa. Tessa said and something Zagre. very interesting, yeah. is that this is the ANC revealing itself. Mm. I'm coming back to you on the report, by the way, but, yeah, but the future, yeah, the future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You see, I mean, we had a brief discussion earlier about uh, the top ten nominees mm. uh, into the NEC. It's yeah. quite a mixed bag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's... Uh, right? <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly, yeah. uh, all in equal measure. Mm. With an emphasis on the latter. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the ANC revealing itself for what it is, mm -hmm. right? So uh, for the ANC, for instance, to have MQs are getting 900 or something votes, yes, distant from Cyril, but it's an indication <coughs> that someone like him enjoys quite a lot of support in mm -hmm. the ANC. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, say for instance in the in the for some reason that the ANC votes Mkiza in, but that would be an ANC revealing itself for what it is. Mm -hmm. And so, and so the, the public, the electorate, would then react to that. And ultimately, I think there would be no, no, no um, uh, uncertainty about what kind of an animal we're dealing with here. Buzz Vesil, right? The, you know, the genies out of the bottle, Mkolupan, they're out there. So you know what you're dealing with. And that, I think, has a large, greater, has a greater potential to, to shift things in uh, much more decisive directions. Um, so so I, would be, I would be fine with that. Um, but even if, let's say, Paul, Paul, Cyril doesn't come back, Paul wins. And Cyril, I mean, we've had this, you said this thing, that we're not entirely happy with Cyril, and perhaps we, are, we feel safe because of what he has done, and so we're not try, we, we can't imagine someone else, but um, because he hasn't done entirely well, I think we should open ourselves to, to something slightly better than him. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if there is that, if Paul is that or whatever. But generally, a huge part of the ANC, and the ANC DNA is largely conservative. ANC policies are all the same. People shout loud because they want to get uh, positions and I mean, very few people are hugely committed to particular ideological positions that are different from the center or far away from the center. Else is just, anything else is just rhetoric. They, they project themselves to be radicals, but they are covering up for something else. So, so the figurehead of the ANC, yes, does determine the image and perhaps the direction of the ANC, but, but by and large, whoever wins, pretty much the ANC remains the same. Pretty much remains the same. So, so I'm, not, I'm not too obsessed about that, about the personality. If Paul wins, still fine. Paul is a Tokyo Sekhwale clone. Bus uh, politicians who likes business, gets along with business people, same way as uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, let me pick up on that. Because, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so this year I made a, a, a decision in the first week of the year when Parliament was burning but the ANC was golfing that I was not going to do ANC commentary. So you guys really, this is very lucky because I've said <laughs> no to everyone else. But, my assessment of the, the Ramaphosa presidency um, is not just one where, you know, there was this great anticipation and then just, you know, um, a failure to deliver. It's a presidency for me of neglect. And the problem with neglect is, is it's worse than um, malevolence. Because when somebody has got a bad intention, and they state their bad intention, you can see their bad intention, and they're playing out their bad intention. You, you are, we all set up in a position to go, okay, we must do something to like stop this. But neglect leads to decay, and decay is slow, and you don't see it, and you don't feel the effects immediately, and then the next thing you know, the bottom is out. And I feel like this has been an administration of neglect. 
we, it, you know, you, you were raising the issue of not having met the, the security cluster. I was in the National Planning Commission. It took the president two years to see the Planning Commission. I mean, Jacob Zuma didn't see us more often, but this was also a president who helped write that plan. So we must say that the, the, the way in which the ANC has gotten to this point is that it's so focused on itself in terms of individuals and the party and its infrastructure and its funding and its, that it has just neglected the country. We are suffering from neglect as a country and the future does not look bright if we are looking to the ANC who neglected us to take us back and become slightly better than itself. Also, the slightly better than Cyril thing is not gonna work, guys. That bar is too low. We, we accepted better than Zuma because we all decided anything was better than Zuma. But we can't say the same now. We're four or five years into this. If Cyril was gonna deliver, he should have delivered. If this ANC was gonna renew, it should have been renew renewed. So when I think about what this moment means for the future, for me it means very little, to be honest. The one thing I want South Africans to think about during the next week and a half is to remember that the ANC does not choose the president of the country. It chooses the president of the ANC. We, in 2024, choose the president of the country. And so when we assess what the ANC does next week, we are not assessing the leader they choose. We are assessing the entirety of the party and whether or not we are willing to place our fate anywhere near it. Because we choose who leads the country. We choose which parties make our parliament and who's going to make those decisions about who's going to be president. It's parliament and its representatives that elect the president. The president's not getting elected next week for 2024. And once we reconcile with that, we get out of this idea that our imagination is trapped about what's possible. Because even within the ANC and our broader politics, our politics has become a political, politics of elite in ways that are so, so detrimental to us. Because now it's not only a, a I mean, the majority of people in this country are not in political parties. The ANC and the EFF are now the biggest parties with a million members each. If we, if we don't send Eusebius to go and verify, yeah. Yeah. then we just take Julius <laughs> at his word, right? That two million people out of 40 million. And then smaller parties are not gonna be anywhere near that. Which means the majority of us are not in parties. So when we allow ourselves to let Nazarak or the Tuli House decide for all of us, we've actually created a system where there is no social contract because we've given our power away. And what I would like us to see is us starting to take our power back and starting to recognize that the political power parties and their power and the party bosses is not the only place where politics can happen. It's, it's not just we just go and vote and then we sit back and watch for five years. That can't be it. A young man earlier this year in some work we did said the reason why he's not voting is because we only get the vote and they get the democracy. We must undo that. Democracy must be a practice every day of the year, not every five years for five minutes. So I hope that that's the rupture that happens for us after this conference, that we realize the ANC doesn't get to choose who leads the country in 24, at a party level, at a level of individuals, at the level of cabinet. We as the country do that. And the second thing we must do is we must set the agenda for 2024. We must not wait for political parties six months before the time to come and sell us manifestos as if they car, car salesmen, no. We must say this is what the agenda for 2024 must be. Because the passive politics is not gonna work. Just resisting is not going to work. Um, this is the last thing I'll say before I move on, just because it's in my mind. I've made an analogy this year that I, I've now come to think is pretty cute, so I'm gonna say it. <laughs> that I've started to imagine that South Africa in terms of our politics is like a car driving off a cliff. And what most of us have done is we've stood outside the car 
and we've been clamoring because the person at the wheel is a bad driver and is driving at speed towards the cliff. And we're like, stop, whoa, yeah, whoa. You know, we're please, making all sort of please, signals, no. we're tapping, we're jumping. And just before the cliff, we go, hi, he'll see to finish. He's going to find out what a bad driver is now. <laughs> the only problem is the car is ours. It's our car. And we appointed the driver. We appointed the driver. And then when we asked to drive, we're like, I know, uh, driving is not for me. If we were not willing to drive the car, we're going to be in trouble, guys. I'm going to come to audience after your reflections, Lizega. So do start thinking of some of your questions, and then we'll open the conversation up to you too. Uh, Lizega, your thoughts on what we've heard so far, and also thinking about the future as you invoked us to do, and mm. the, the country beyond simply the president or even the ANC. I was actually, I had a, a, a meeting with uh, Gwede Mandashe yesterday. Um, to paraphrase what he said, um, he was talking about the ANC and, <clears throat> and the responsibility of MPs to their constituency as well as to the country mm. in terms of the voting, uh, rejecting of voting in terms of parliament, uh, Palapala. <clears throat> and what he said uh, was, in, in no uncertain words, was that MPs, uh, in Parliament must be aware that they are the agents of the party. Um, and in no uncertain terms can they veer away from the party's uh, uh, stance. Uh, whether be, uh, you know, conscience be damned. I even said that to him, conscience be damned. Mm -hmm. and um, Telling you of where the ANC is. Uh, it's, it's the same place that the ANC was in, in 2017 or 2018 during the motion of no confidence against uh, President Zuma. Mm -hmm. And this term of renewal, in terms of this renewal narrative by the ANC, I mean, Prof, maybe you'll correct me there. I think 2017, 2018, uh, Sarah Ramaphosa was talking unity. You didn't hear anything about renewal. It was, the mandate was unity and renewal, but he was focused on unity. Uh, maybe one could argue that because of the fracture uh, with, uh, in the ANC, that was his core focus. But uh, there was no sense that the ANC was alive to the gravity and the enormity of the damage that it had. It had it caused within itself in the country, it, it must renew. Um, I think only around late 2018 did he start now talking renewal, and that, that was also after Tabombe, he started raising this issue. Um, my only problem, or my only worry uh, with South Africans is that they don't seem to think that they have an alternative or we don't seem to think that we have an alternative outside of the ANC. For instance, the ANC now is bound to dip below 50%. Um, it's, 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 it's lost, it's, it's, I mean, it's a figment of its, uh, of its former glory, but we still discuss the ANC as if, you know, the ANC is, is the most uh, pivotal party in, in, in the country. The DA, unfortunately, is in the same to a certain degree is in the same kind of situation as the ANC, doesn't know whether it's coming or going. Um, we don't know who's the leader. Is it Stian Azen or is it Helen? Who's in charge? The, the, EFF, the EFF kind of today, it loves Didi Mabuza, tomorrow, it's so entrenched in ANC politics. The man will sit in a panel of six of his uh, top six and he only speaks, it's only him who's speaking and he's contradicting himself throughout that. So South Africans don't have an idea of an alternative. I think that's partly the reason why the youth is not energized 
to cooperate and, and to be part of this, this change that Tessa wants, is talking about. So I think those are the things that we need to look at. These, you know, these forums such as uh, Rivonia Circle, I'm not sure if at this point South Africans have that appetite. I'm not sure if 2024 the ANC will dip below 50% uh, uh, because of these the situation that we find ourselves. No alternative, no energy, no appetite from the country's uh, citizens. Well, thank you so much um, for your interventions and your thoughts. Can we, before we come to the audience, just give a round of applause to the audience for a very stimulating <laughs> and interesting conversation. Um, and thank you all very much for I've, I've been refreshed because I feel like I haven't been able to have this conversation. And the conversations in the media are often so fast, you have to get it into two minutes and you can't really reflect and debate and discuss. So thank you for that and I'm gonna turn over to the audience and we won't see it as a traditional you ask questions and the panel answers. What no. we'll do is just ask for your views, interventions, questions, objections, uh, agreements and we'll just hear from you, and then we'll come back to the panel and summarize and move forward from there. So, uh, thank you very much, sir. I see you. Is there a second person who'd like to ask a question? Uh, thank you. And My then a third. So, so we'll take, we'll take it in, in that order, the three, and then we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tede Muloy. Uh, you know, I'm fascinated. I hear uh, there is a serious dis a huge distance between the speakers. Uh, and this, what you hear here is, you ask a question about the past two weeks, both speakers go directly to the crux of the issue of Palapala, and professors start about uh, the so-called uh, nine wasted years, how Ramaphosa is a victim. And section 89 speaks about a. Uh, Breaker Act being broken, exchange controls, but now Professor calls that incompetence. And I'm not sure why is Professor, there, is there any specific reason for Professor to dilly dally around the issue of Palapa? That's one question that I want to understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. One, two. Yes. Just for recording purposes, I think we're going to use that okay. mic. I think this might be working. Is it good? Is it good? Cool. Great. Well, it's not a question for me. Um, mm. Some of uh, the people who wanted to be here tonight uh, sent through questions to the Mail and Guardian. So a question, I guess, to the panel, and I'm not sure if it was partly responded to from... It's a question from a Saki Lechlela, and his question is... Is a post-ANC South Africa really imaginable? Hmm. I'm going to throw that to you, Suzo, because I do think that you had done a piece a little while ago about reimagining South Africa, ANC, with it, without it. And I think when, when you get back to the panel, um, I'd like yeah, to, that, an answer to that question. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, my name is Anele. Just a comment I have is that one thing I liked about the whole Palapala situation is that it shows that there are no good people in the ANC and they're all rotten and I hope that South Africans can see past them. But when I look at social media and what the youth is saying and what the media is actually writing is that the issue, the education around the fact that a crime has been committed is not being highlighted enough. It's more like it's a joke, it's a couch. I read an article on The Economist, and even the headline was making a joke out of it. And I'm, not, I'm sure ordinary South Africans don't read The Economist, but it is, it, is, it is quite appalling how we don't actually recognize this as a crime, which actually then brings me to, to reflect that maybe the ANC conference does actually produce another in, a South African president, because we actually don't take things seriously. The one thing I wanted to ask is, um, 
I think, um, sorry, the lady at the front read out a, a, com uh, a question about what does a post ANC um, uh, yeah, look like? I mean, like we've seen in Johannesburg, it's been a disaster, a Kuruleni, a disaster. How, you know, I just wanted to understand, you know, just, you know, reiterate the point around the panel that, you know, yes, we, it's the ANC, the DA, and the EFF, but is there, what do you think that, that that sort of coalition looks like? If it doesn't work at municipality level, nationally, how much more of a disaster that, does that actually look like? Or does it actually become a progressive thing? Or to, for us to see progress, does, do there need to be an absolute outright winner? Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll come back for We'll come back for another round of questions, so if you have any thoughts or if any thoughts come to you as we discuss, we'll come back to the audience. Um, shall we, Prof, you had uh, a question put well, to you and I suppose life, we can, yeah. Life would be very boring if we all started mimicking each other. No, true, true. So, so I guess people have to answer questions the, the way they think they have to answer them and how they, they have thought about them. So my take on Pala Pala is inevitably different because I'm me and I'm not about to mimic them because the gentleman is once mimicry. Uh, my point about Pala Pala is I've just, as I've just said, and I've written about it, there are a lot of questions that have to be answered. Um, let that be investigated, let it be answered. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anything new I need to say on it. Uh, I think he's unhappy that I didn't mimic anybody, so I guess, yeah. Um, there were many questions about the future, yeah. what does South Africa look like beyond the ANC? Uh, Tessa, is yeah. that what you wanna? I, I have many thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I, I shall spend, also weigh I spend in. all my time thinking about that. Mm. <laughs> it's mm. the only thing I care about at this point. Um, so number one, I think we need to, and, and this actually, so you are very much responsible for where my political life is right now, by the way. Is that so? Because about um, a year and a half ago, I think you and Lukwana Mgune had that conversation that mm. this question actually came up. Yeah. Um, and that, that conversation really triggered me. Because what Lukwana I'm going to say that day is he said, we need to start preparing the country for the eventuality of the ANC not being at the center of, our pow of, of power and our politics. And that doesn't mean the ANC disappears, but that it's not at the center, i.e. it's not the 51 plus, plus, of the 50 plus one party, it's not the party that wields the most financial control, the, the most power in, in different ways. And the reason why that's important, I've come to understand, is number one, we don't know what happens when the ANC loses and how the ANC might respond to that loss. We do know that the ANC has a lot of levers in power it could pull and in, in society it could pull. And for me, the July unrest is one of the reasons why I'm most concerned that I don't know how the ANC is going to respond. And we also just don't know which ANC is gonna turn up on any day. So I think we need to prepare ourselves for the idea that as a society, we're not going to be baited into the ANC's political battles as it responds to its loss of power. We must be able to say we're comfortable with the idea of the ANC losing so that it, the ANC doesn't bait us into a warfare that it's fighting to stay in power. The second thing we must do is we must be absolutely vigilant about the 2024 elections and any chances of manipulation, violence, or rigging. We must just take that seriously as an idea. Because as Prof has stated, there are so many versions of the ANC in different factions, and we don't know who the good guys, who the bad guys are, how powerful the bad guys are, where they are. So we must stay alert. But uh, on a more positive note, and that's been a difficult to get to in this conversation, so let's try. Number one, I think it's necessary for the ANC to not be at the center of power and for us to start thinking about a post-ANC um, society, not because of the ANC per se, but because it's healthy for democracy 
to have different centers of power in society and to have ways in which we don't have to be at the behest of one grouping of people. Our, and our constitution wasn't set up for that. We were set up as a multi-party um, democracy for a reason. So it's actually been anomalous that we've had a big party at the center for so long. So there needs to be a cultural shift in our minds that says it is not the end of the world if we don't have a big party, especially if we don't have one big party replacing another, which leads into the coalition's question. Coalitions aren't the boogeyman. They're just an outcome. Um, around the world, there are many countries who have not seen a single dominant party in decades. They're fine. <laughs> Because coalitions aren't an evil that, you know, gobbles up people's political sensibilities. They are an outcome of an election that needs to be managed. The other thing is that we are only, because of the way the media operates, focusing on the big metro coalitions. There are 66 hung municipalities in this country. Not all of them are disintegrating. And in fact, some of the best ones are ones where there are multiple parties that are very local and where those, those, those parties have local constituencies. Um, we were talking to the Makanda Community Forum, which is a, a political movement that was formed from different civic organizations in, in Makanda that came together and decided to contest. That political movement is not even about a single ideological group, because the unemployed people's movement is a part of it, as well as the business association, right? But they described how coming into a coalition, into coalition politics with that arrangement gave them already a head start in coalescing because they needed to coalesce to form the movement that would contest. And so their, their sensibilities are different because they are coalescing around the ideas. And I think we just need to, um, we need to challenge ourselves and challenge our politics to coalesce around ideas rather than personalities. That will help our, our coalition politics a lot. But we can also prepare, and the, the DA is not right about many things. The DA is wrong about a lot. But the DA is right about the fact that we can put on the table legislation before 2024 that helps guide how coalitions form. So one of the things that's, that's making Joburg, for instance, a mess. Number one, at, um, at municipal level, you have 14 days to come up with a coalition agreement from the time that the election is declared. That is not a long time to figure out a five-year relationship between seven, eight, nine different parties that come from different strands. Of course it's gonna be messy. Number two, you don't have strong bureaucracy that is depoliticized enough to give space for the politics to be able to move. Because when Palazzo is in, Palazzo is in now we must change everything, people are losing their jobs, next week, Dada's back, people, we, can't, we, we need to protect the administration from the politics a lot more, and that will help us out. But the, the ultimate point is there are ways to run factual um, coalitions, and they're not just about mature politics and politicians. They're actually about systems and structures. But the last thing I want to say in response to both questions, you know, what the, the, can we imagine a future? I think for me, there, there, there are a few things we can do to imagine that future. The one is disabuse ourselves of the idea that a political party can look a, only a particular way. And that the only way you can engage in politics is if you become a member of a party. What, what must happen is we must say to ourselves, whether I'm a, polit a political party member or not, I must learn how to have a say in our politics on a more consistent basis. How can I get that done? So we need to think about that, this kind of um, politics outside of the electoral system, so that we, we re-energize and reimagine a little bit better. Um, the other thing about it is, this is not just about new parties or a different party must take over. And then, you know, one of the mistakes we made in 94 is we really just replaced one big um, party with another. And I don't think that that's the future. 
In the 2021 local government elections, 325 parties contested. That says something about the psyche of where voters are, the ones that are engaged. That they're willing to vote for even a small micro party in a community because there's something voters want that they're not getting from big party politics anymore. It, and it's as simple as my father saying, I'm not voting because I don't know anyone on that ballot. People are looking for politics that is local, that is close, and representation is at the heart of this. They want to feel represented in that parliament. And so the last thing is that voters are the key. Voters are the key to imagining a future outside of the ANC. Because what voters have done so far is we have withdrawn en masse. Only a third of eligible people are actually showing up. And so it's that two thirds saying, we actually have more power than the people that voted for the ANC. And starting to have a conversation in society about what we do with our vote, where the real magic lies. Isega, your thoughts? I'm gonna be very, very brief, I think. Uh, they've uh, spoken very widely on all the points that I needed to speak on. Um, New Nation Movement. Uh, they went to the Constitutional Court. Um, they wanted independence to be more engaged in terms of the national elections. That's, uh, uh, that's uh, active citizenry. Yep. Um, what Tessa is saying about withdrawing, we have withdrawn. You hardly see any CPFs in the community. Um, the ordinary, I remember Elokshini, uh, when I was growing up, you wouldn't see potholes because we'd actively ensure that there weren't potholes on the streets. That's, we, we've, we've somehow detached ourselves from Active, active citizenry, and that's a problem. And I'm not sure how we can uh, claw ourselves back into that kind of imagination. Uh, but I think it's, I think new nation movement was a, a signal that we can actually start changing things. We do have institutions which could aid us. Chapter nine institutions are there for us. Um, I think if you're looking at, for instance, uh, the the public protector. The public protector is, is there to ensure that you are aided uh, in terms of corruption within, within government. Uh, there's several institutions, civil society, uh, how it's, civil society has been the backbone of um, uh, our constitutional democracy. Even t in the times of Tabombeki during the HIV AIDS era, um, I think we do have those structures. I don't know how we can uh, illuminate them or, or, or elevate them, but I think we do have, we, we can imagine a, a, a South Africa outside of the ANC, and I think we have, we have all the recipes in place. We just need to hoi everything in the pot and start cooking. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, round off our conversation. Um, so I'll take another round of interventions. They don't have to be direct questions. They can be, but don't expect the panelists to be able to respond in full. And then I'll ask everyone to come back with just a one minute closing remark. So the floor is once again open. I'll, I'll deal with the question of after the ANC as one of the one minute closing remarks as well. Um, so please feel free, make interventions, uh, and deepen our discussion. Welcome. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Um, my name is Namsa. Namsa Saba. Um, I love this conversation because ultimately, at the end of the day, this is our country, and we need to make it work. And um, two main things are consistently standing out for me in terms of South Africa, and that is leadership, and that is accountability. And, um, and also the third one, okay, the third one is more in terms of if we want different, we have to vote differently. And previously, our constant way of voting is waiting for political parties to tell us what the manifesto is, who's got the loudest voice, who's shouting, you know, the loudest, who's got the best gossip or whatever the case may be. 
and um, we vote on the basis of that. But we need to now start having conversations and teaching youth and actually having education amongst the youth in terms of what are the core things that we need to be looking for from our leaders. Because people do the things that they are held accountable for. And so if we start asking our leaders for them to start showing casing, showcasing us not just gossip or just the most radical thing that they can come up with, but what are the values, what are the ethics, where has, I mean, you've been around for the past 10 years, where can you showcase A, B, C, and D? You've been around for the past 30 years, where has this you know, been shown in what it is that you have been saying you stand for? And then on the basis of that, we then come back to the ballot box, because now it's just about the party or the leader who makes the loudest noise, but we have to go back in terms of that leadership to say, what are we looking for? Instead of them waiting for them to tell us what that leadership is supposed to look like, we are the ones that are supposed to tell them what we want and accept nothing less. Because as much as the bar keeps on going down, it's because they're the ones that keep on taking the bar down and we keep on going lower with them with that bar. It's time for us to increase that bar and say, mm -mm, this is what it is. And it starts off with that ballot box. Because I remember in the work that we do with the, with the youth and whatever the case may be, we're having these conversations about why is it that they're not voting. And some of the youth were saying, listen, we do want to vote, but we don't even know what to vote for. We only know what our parents, you know, um, used to say or what it is they're voting for, who makes the loudest noise, but we don't know what else to ask for. So that's one. And that two, number two, is around the accountability aspect of things. After we're done voting, then what? We vote and then withdraw. But then what are the systems, especially from a community perspective? Because at the end of the day, I understand what's happening on a macro perspective. At the end of the day, people are concerned about what is happening in their communities. Um, as much as, yes, we understand who leads, at the end of the day, it's the, it's the local communities where the rubbish is not being picked up, where sewage is falling into their Street. communities or whatever, the, mm -hmm. their streets and whatever the case may be. How can they hold those accountable and how do we ensure that active citizenship is happening at that level? And how do we bring our youth into that level whereby they themselves are ensuring that they're holding their municipalities to account? And yes, there's that account, and business needs to account. So there's accountability mm. from so many levels where it's, it's government, it's the macro, it's the micro, and business transformation, they need to account. So accountability isn't just for government, it's, it's accountability across the different areas, Absolutely. and if we're able to have that leadership going through. Thank you. Thanks very much, Namsa. Let's go next to you, noted, noted. Um, hi everyone, I've just got a very simple question. How do we do this for the youth? Um, because there are young people that are uninterested in politics because this is how, how things are going. Um, <laughs> where do we start? Do we start in schools? Do we start in homes? Because I always say to people that um, you cannot be uninterested about politics because they influence the bread that you, you eat on a daily basis. And then uh, coming to the ANC, there are good people in the ANC. Um, I don't know if I should say this, but anyway, no, let me not. But um, the thing is, someone must help me with the first question that I, I, I asked, because you'll find these individuals that are really trying to push change within the ANC, but every time you try, there are 10 other people that are suppressing you because there's an agenda that has to be pushed. So I find it very difficult. I mean, we can have these conversations. The reality is that the conference is going to sit. Um, people are going to decide. For instance, I'm originally from the rural area. All they know is the ANC. Because of the platforms that it has created today, um, someone like me from the rural area, I can speak in the Queen's language because of people within the ANC that have made those sacrifices. I mean, I cringe when I think of Chris Ani. I, I, when I think of, of O.R. Tam and I'm like, oh, it, when I think of Winnie Madigizela Mandela, uh, when she was in solitary confinement, she couldn't be with her family. And I say, what do we do? Because it's, it's frustrating. We'll have these conversations. Someone will emerge in the ANC. People in the rural area majority, the Eastern Cape will vote. And, but how do we effectively bring this change when the youth that has power, that, can, that are the future leaders, they can change a generation, but they're uninterested, and they're not willing to get into these political structures. Thanks so much. 
Any other thoughts? We have one more there. There was one at the back. Oh, I had a quick one. So, okay, great. Sure. Hi, my name is oh, Lindsay. Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi. I, I, I really enjoyed all your faith in institutions, but um, my concern with institutions is that um, I too have had faith in our constitution, but the, you know, we saw this happening in the previous regime. We had a hollowing out of institutions right down to who was able to investigate, right? And what has been interesting about the last week is that we've seen the opposing faction use similar tactics. And now we're, t we're personalizing the panel and we're personalizing um, who is investigating and rather than having the faith in our institutions. And we're at the point where, yes, it's important to have a healthy conversation about the judiciary, but we're not having a healthy conversation, we're having a factional conversation. And so this faith that we're having in institutions, I just want to know, is, you, is your faith still as strong? Because I'm thinking even the chapter nine institutions, I can't, I'm a member of the beleaguered um, fourth estate, and I can't remember when was the last time I did a public protector story that was focused on a small community mm. like I used to when it just, you know, when we first mm. started testing this chapter. So I'm just wondering, how's your faith? Thank Thanks you, so much. Uh, I, I hear uh, a professor says, um, <laughs> Are you back? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, professor says, uh, Maybe we don't want Ramaphosa to leave because we feel safe with what he has done. While I also hear a polar opposite view saying we have given our car to a negligent driver. And so I wanted to ask if maybe Professor can elaborate what Cyril has done because while I hear the polar opposite that says we've given our car to an Asian driver, here we have a, a metro rail that has collapsed. Today there is a study that says a, a corruption has worsened under Ramaphosa. We have a neoliberal ideology that reduces public spending. That's why we have serious crime that we are facing, high unemployment. So maybe Professor can elaborate what Cyril has done. Maybe it's part of my first question because he did not answer about this polar views that I hear. Then I wanted to understand maybe what Cyril has done. Thanks very much. Um, and I hasten to add, you didn't even mention stage six load shedding. Uh, <laughs> to be kind. Um, any other thoughts or views or anything that's been on your mind? This is a very eminent panelist, not only a preeminent South African, <laughs> but also happens to be my mother. So, which is why I'm slightly apprehensive of speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, we've had incredible questions from women in the audience. We have two incredibly impressive women on a panel. Somebody mentioned Winnie Mandela, and my heart also sank. Where are the women? <sighs> why are women not, we talk about big man politics and we sat down and we talk man to man. I think as women, we need to get on our feet. Really, I, I was just struck by the incredible questions that you all asked, and especially by, by Tessa and by Lizeka. But we're not making an impact out there. I think that's an apt place to round off the interventions from the audience. Thank you so much for the fascinating interventions and the probing questions. And as I said, it's not going to be possible, Prof. Jana, you'll be happy to hear, <laughs> to deal in depth with each question. But I think we've heard the, the conversation. But can I ask each of you to just round off in a minute with your final closing thoughts. And we'll start with Lizega, then come to Prof. Letyana and end off with, with Tessa. The question, where are the women? Uh, it's a question, I, I, I don't know how to respond to that question. Uh, mm. I ask myself that question all the time. I report on, on politics and more often than not, the, the, the people who are making those decisions are the men and the women are just, uh, the proponents and the, you know, aiding these men. Uh, we have uh, very strong, powerful, intelligent women. Um, I'll count people like Helen Ziller in that list. 
uh, in terms of politics, I'll count, you know, the Naledi Pandors, um, you know, capable women. And I was asking Lindy Wezulu, um, I, I was doing a cabinet report, I'll keep it short, cabinet report, and I asked her, ma'am, um, why is it that none of you, as the women, have come out to say, I am available? Not, not to be led by branches or not to be, but to say I am available. And it's, it's always the same, same explanation, uh, patriarchy within the party. Um, and who then is, who then leads? Who then um, leads that movement of women to say, you know what, enough is enough in terms of this patriarchy within the ANC? But um, it's a very loaded question. It's, it's, um, it's saddening um, because it also translates to not only, you know, it's not only the politics, but it also translates to the house, how, women, how the woman is, uh, the role of the woman at, in the house, the role of the, a woman in, uh, in business, in the business sector, in corporate, and at work. Uh, it's a very sad reality. Uh, there's a lot to be to unpack. We'd have to spend a, uh, an entire hour, another hour, speaking about the role of women or, or lack thereof. And yeah, it it it's, it's, it touches me. Thanks so much, Lizega. I think we have another critical thinking forum already lined up because, as you say, I think this is probably a question that mm. we need to actually dedicate resources, time, and agenda to. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Prof, uh, closing thoughts? Um, I'm not really worried about the levels of um, popular participation of, or activism in our politics. I think, I can't remember the exact figure for 2021 elections um, in terms of voter turnout. Could have been in the upper 50s or something like that. Maybe Tessa would know. Um, but the, the level of diversity in terms of representation in councils, I think coalitions were 72. Uh, that diversity for me shows a lot of interest and initiative. Um, and the other good thing is that, I mean, I, I've had the opportunity in the last few years to write a lot on this stuff. Uh, Mistra and looking at provinces throughout the country. A small door piece in the Northern Cape Namakwa Civic Movement um, in the north, in the in the in the Western Cape, in the Eastern Cape, doctors, teachers, business people, um, getting involved. Uh, King Williamstown uh, shop shop owner decided that now he's had enough of this. He got involved, and Moses Movement did a lot of stuff there. So there are people who have decided that instead of staying back and not doing anything, mm. they've decided to get involved. So the diversity of, of representation is indicative, I think, of some worthwhile or noteworthy level of activism. Um, so I'm kind of encouraged by that. Youth voters, I mean, youth, I don't know if a country where 19 year olds are enthusiastic about voting. Um, you vote because you have a stake in the system. That is why 30, 32 year olds up mm. until the 40s or whatever, those constitute your largest segment of the voting population because these are people, all of a sudden they are paying tax, they are taking their kids to school, they are this and that. Um, unless there's something that is quite particular to the youth that gets them involved, but generally uh, it's, not, it's not something that is, that is common. Faith institution, you have to keep faith in the institutions. <laughs> you have to keep faith in the institutions because these are we have decided to surrender certain powers to institutions that, and we pay tax, um, and so we defer all these things, we give them resources, they have to take care of us. If we surrender, if we give a faith in the institutions, then it means that we don't have anyone else to take care, to do the public conduct, the public regulation that is meant to be done. It means that I have to take care of my uh, problems. I have to take up a gun or a knobkiri somewhere and sort things out. So you can never 
because public institutions are, are um, a codification of the rules and values that we as a society share and we decide that these are the rules by which we shall abide and the police and everybody else must regulate society according to these rules. Um, if we give up on that, then it means that we then recede back into our individual existence. Do as we please. There's no shared sense of community. Uh, there's no collective action. So community dies as part of that. So we have to keep working at it. It might not be working well, but we have to. Um, I think you have to look at the panel purely from an intellectual perspective. Um, the panel had, had severe limitations in their work. I think they were given a task for which they were not equipped with proper tools to execute a proper job. It's nothing personal about the, I haven't gotten, I don't enter debates about personalities when it comes to those individuals. I, 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 I rejected answering those questions early on elsewhere to say, I'm not going to speculate no, no, no but did this or Silo did that, I don't know. But purely on the basis of their work, I think they had severe limitations that they had faced. And lastly, my dear friend, <laughs> you know, um, uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, years ago, he was still president, a uh, very saintly figure as we all know, uh, said it is not the business of government to create jobs. That's, uh, I'm talking on this neoliberal thing, rhetoric or slogan. That was, that was a quintessential, if you, if you like, neoliberal statement. And, and, and Mandela went on to protect and encourage Tabo to come up with uh, a, 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 an austerity program. And this happens under Mandela, right? Uh, and Tabo comes in in 99 and Tabo pushes very hard. He privatizes this and that. Um, and at some point, Cyril comes in. Well, Zuma came. I'm not talking about Zuma. I'll avoid <laughs> nine years. So Cyril comes in and he finds uh, everybody else uh, discovers this, that state institutions are not working, the state doesn't have money this. So, so, so what do you do with state institutions that are dysfunctional? Do you keep on funding them just because you don't want to be labeled neo, neoliberal? I mean, come on, let's be smart about these things. You know, let's just, let's just rise to the occasion. This is elementary stuff. You know, common sense. Labels don't help. I mean, let's just look at it. This is a university for God's sake. We can't be throwing labels around as if we have no sense of history. Right? So, 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 so I hope, I hope, I hope at some point, you know, labels are good, well and good. You know, it uh, gets you kudos somewhere. But common sense also takes us a long way. Thanks. Well. <laughs> well, well, well. Imagine. Um, I want to start with the institutions question. If I were to assess the Ramaphosa presidency on anything, is I think that he has not come up with plans to increase the competency and function of institutions. He's not taken time to look at whether the institutions are working the way they should and come up with plans to turn them around or shut them down in ways that are productive for the country. I have not lost faith in institutions. I've lost faith in the competency of the people who are running the institutions. And I've lost faith in us about whether or not we are taking a, a good look at what these institutions are and whether they work for us or not. Um, Prof and I are going to agree for the first time tonight, maybe, in that institutions are essential. And we need them and we need to be able to coalesce around things and we need to be able to, to bring ourselves around things that help us order society. But what we must not do is become so married to an institution that we cannot reflect on that institution and change it. One of the young people, um, and I, I call her a young person, but really, I mean, she's just, she's somebody who I prefer, regard, regard as a leader, said almost flippantly, and I was just like, she said, we will not be married to the Freedom Charter just because it's the Freedom Charter if the Freedom Charter no longer serves us. And well, because that's the, the, the stance we must take on institutions. We make them. And so we must be able to reform them, reject them, change them,
do the things, but we must commit to them, and we must commit to making them work. That's my first novel. My minute hasn't started yet, by the way. I'm still responding to questions. <laughs> Leave my minute alone. Who said anything about Leave a minute? Leave my minute alone. I saw, the, I saw the sign. The second point I wanted to make was in response to something you said about good people in the ANC. You cannot have a one million person organization and not have good people. There must be good people in the one million somewhere. Absolutely. And it is because there's one million people in that organization and they are clinging to dear life for Cyril not to resign or else the sky will fall. That makes me understand that it doesn't matter that there are good people in the ANC. As an infrastructure and an edifice, it is broken. And it, you know, for history's sake alone, it should fix itself. I just don't want them to do it on my dime or my time. Just bring my money back, bring my time back. You guys gonna sort it out. When you're done, come back. We'll, we'll accept you back. You're Mandela's party, we're cool. Mm. But just go and sort it out, guys. I keep saying to ANC people, you cannot fix the ANC in the country at the same time. You guys are gonna have to choose. And I don't have to make that choice as somebody who's not a member of the ANC. But good people in the ANC are having to make the choice between choosing between fixing the ANC and fixing the country. We have run out of time for that choice. If they choose to fix the ANC, they must just know it's gonna be at the expense of the country. And I'm just not, I'm not game for that. So now my one minute. <laughs> You're becoming like an ANC politician now. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I know. But I, I reserve my one minute for this. Is it goes back to that question about the future beyond the ANC. We need to organize for what we want. It's as simple as that. And Prof, you're exactly right. And you're not right about the stat because it was about 45% turnout, but if you exclude, or if you include into that number people who are unregistered, it's around 30% turnout for 2021. So it is actually in a bit of a crisis. But that doesn't negate the fact that there are still people who want into the system and are trying, and are trying in big and small ways through electoral politics, outside of electoral politics, I mean, you can go to any community, drop a hat, and somebody's doing something somewhere. This country is not being held together by its institutions right now. It's being held together by communities, stitching things together and like coming up with markup plan type of existence. And that is where the hope for the country lies. And the only difference between that succeeding or failing is how we organize. Um, I've I've narrowed down what I think that looks like to saying we need a new UDF. We need a new energy that says, we are gonna take all of our small efforts and we're going to strategize it into one thing. But that thing for the UDF was to be anti-apartheid. And I think for us, that thing is going to have to be for something. Resistance politics, the politics of anger, somebody said yesterday, we're just not angry enough. I'm like, we're angry, guys. We're angry. I promise you, we're all angry. Even ANC voters are angry. But anger is not going to be the thing. And we're, we're like, we're done searching for a common enemy. What I believe is necessary is a common goal. And a politics of hope, not anger. A politics of vision and aspiration and looking forward and I think if we found a minimal viable goal, because we disagree about too much in this country, mm. honestly, to even find a common enemy. If we just found one common goal, that even just like 60% of us can say, okay, that thing. We then energize our politics with agency. And that's what we've lost. We've lost our sense of agency. We gave our agency to the political institution. And we must just take it back. We must reclaim politics for all of us, reclaim politics as something we can do in our homes, in our families. I absolutely believe that the way you start politics and getting it back is at your dinner table in, inside your family. Who's leading your family? How is your family connected to the things that are happening in the country? How are you determining how you're going to vote? I absolutely believe it's going to start there. If nothing else, we're going to have to reclaim our politics on a day-to-day -day basis 
and make sure that when it comes to 24, 26, whatever it is, that we say to politicians, we set the agenda, we set the terms of your contract, we will hire you, and if you do not execute on our mandate, we will fire you. Hmm. You're allowed to clap. <laughs> I just want to say, Lizega, uh, Prof. Nzetiana, um, to Tessa as well, um, Ms. Dooms. Dooms? Dooms, Dooms, Dooms. like yeah, the spray. Thank you. thank you. I've always wondered. <laughs> like the spray. Uh, Ms. Tandwa, um, thank you so much for one of the rare, refreshing conversations about the current situation. Um, I think you all added fascinating insights from the different places from which you come. And thank you for being voices in, in our country right now at this difficult time. And thank you for sharing your insights and expertise with us this evening. So please join me once again in expressing your appreciation for our panel tonight. Your ANC question, sir. I was asked to answer a question, but the duty of a facilitator is to keep <laughs> the guests happy and the show on time. So the only response I will offer is read my column in the mail. And <laughs> That's a good, yeah. good answer. Uh, thank great. you so much. Thanks, and, thanks, uh, Thank you so thank much. You. And I believe that. Um, th there might be some final remarks from Atandiwe just to close us out, um, but thank you again so much for joining us tonight. Again, to the whole panel, thank you so much. Susan, thank you for taking care of tonight and ensuring that we try and keep on time. Uh, to everyone who came today, I really appreciate this. Um, I think just starting to have these conversations. And I know they feel like they are kind of repetitive and, and we've had them before. But I think once we start focusing that we're having these conversations for a specific goal and then we go out there, it's not just gonna be about politics. There's conversations around the economy. There's conversations about how do we save? There's so many conversations I want to have as the mail and guardian with different people in different forums and all of you coming through to those conversations about our everyday lives and how do we find solutions from listening to the experts, understanding how things are working, debating with them, telling them that they're wrong and, and questioning ourselves as well in terms of how do we interact with our everyday South Africa. And I think those, a lot more of those conversations are definitely gonna be happening in 2023. And I can't wait to see all of you again and again and again and again. Thank you so much for coming tonight, my panel. Oh, I owe you guys a great debt. Thank you for joining us at the Critical Thinking Forum, the Mail and Guardian's Critical Thinking Forum, and hope to see you soon again. Please do enjoy the snacks that are left and the drinks, and have a good night.